Welcome to our Careers in Peace Building Talk Story Series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Mazatlan Institute for Peace at the University of Hawaii, Manila. Our talk story today will focus on from Broadway to boardroom to in the metaverse uh, with Loretta Chen. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about the journey into the profession. Uh, today's event um, is co-sponsored by A Common Purpose, Future Skills 101, and Smobler Studios, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, that are all organizations that our, our guest has co-founded. Um, this 90-minute webinar Miller workshop shares insights and case studies from the world of Broadway and the prolific ad agency and how the mastery of creative conflict enables peace building and opens avenues to a wide range of careers. Uh, what are some key lessons that we can glean uh, for mastering creative conflict and peace building? How do we turn our differences into innovation gold? How can design thinking aid in our spousal of creative conflict? And what can all these lessons do to help us secure a job? We will enable participants to work in a case study as well as explore creative collaboration in this engaging interactive session. Our guest today is Dr. Loretta Chen. She's award-winning director, professor, and best-selling author. She was nominated member of parliament and voted one of Asia's most inspiring women despite her spousal of liberal attitudes. Uh, Dr. Chen is a co-founder of A Common Purpose, Future Skills 101, and Mobler Studios. Um, she was also the international consultant to the Kingdom of Bhutan and currently teaches at Leeward Community College as well as here with our Matanaga Institute, uh, actually has a class on peace building and performance uh, this upcoming spring semester. Uh, and as well as teaching at APU Ritmus Ritsumikin University in, out of Japan. Uh, she's a devoted mentor and tireless social justice advocate working with women and youth communities. Her short film, Secrets to Happiness, is touring international film festivals and her latest book, Inspiring Women of Hawaii is available at Costco, Target, and all good bookstores. Uh, proceeds go towards the Women of Hawaii Scholarship Fund. She believes in karma, is a firm believer of paying it forward, and a firm mom to 13 cats, 15 at the moment, going to be 13. Uh, learn more about uh, Dr. Loretta Chen at www.drlorettachen.com and www.acommonpurpose.net. And to get started, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chen. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you so much for that, Jose. That's that's quite a mouthful. You know what you see on screen and then what you have someone when you have someone read it, you're like, oh, wow, I should really shorten that 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 bio. But hi, uh, thank you and welcome, everybody. So uh, what's that in the chat? Yeah, so definitely use the chat, uh, reach out and ask any questions. I know most of you will probably be watching this later on at your own time. So let's get started uh maybe to get started started uh can you all see my let me just share screen right now hold on one second just gonna pull up my share screen button there okay since this is a fairly small um group uh can i just ask everyone around the room to briefly just tell me uh what you would like what what do you expect um, from a talk like from Broadway to boardroom and now the metaverse? I mean, what would you like to, you know, receive at the end of this like 90 minute session? Anyone? Maybe we'll start from you, um, Aaron. And uh, you are able to uh, unmute yourselves. Uh, so please feel free to, to do so. Hi there, sorry, I can't turn my camera on right now. I'm actually in the car and I'm ready to get a flu shot. But um, I'm just excited to be here. You know, I'm in Dr. Chen's uh, Leeward Community College class and I just really appreciate how she always uh, manages to bring her life uh, like skills and her life lessons into and tie it into really anything. And so I just thought today would be a really good experience to hear her speak again and just gain more of the wisdom that she has to offer. Thank you. And you're driving. I hope you're safe, right? You're all belted up and you're just on the speaker. Okay. Uh, what about you? Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Aaron. No, you're good. I was going to say, yep, I'm very safe. My mom's driving. So. Ah, okay. And mom, she's a great student. Just so you know, Auntie, Aaron is a great student. <laughs> all right, Jeremy, uh, what would you expect from a talk uh, with such a title, Broadway to Bart Woman into the Metaverse? Jeremy, if you're there. Any takeaways, Jeremy? Not sure if he's there. Uh, what about you, Caitlin? I know Caitlin tends to not have audio. Caitlin? 
can't hear. Uh, what about you, Laura and, and, and Jose? Any any thoughts? I mean, when you have a speaker coming in to say they want to do a, something with a title of From Broadway to Boardroom and Into the Metaverse, uh, what would you hope to like take away from? Uh, Jose's unmuted. Go ahead, Jose. Well, for me, it's more about the transferable skills. That's what I'm thinking about. Uh, I can understand Broadway to Boardroom a Bit. I do not know what the metaverse is, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about that. I imagine it's something technology, internet based. So, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just from thinking about Broadway skill sets and what it takes to, I mean, the courage and the charisma and the character it takes to be on Broadway. And I imagine that is very useful in the boardroom uh, where there might be a lack of that and so <laughs> well actually there's a lot of that there's a lot of show and tell i think yes, yes. <laughs> and lots of personalities for sure uh what about you laura i mean you're 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 somewhat tacky right somewhat sort of kind of i mean i make it a point to whenever i go into any kind of event or speaker series or anything to not have any expectations and to purposefully try to you know focus on coming in with an open mind because I think having expectations can close you off to an unexpected experience. Whereas if I come in with just no expectation of what I'm about to see and listen to, I might get more from it. So I love that. That pretty much sets the tone for our um, little presentation. So yeah. Um, so I mean, given that this is, you know, a, a, a careers and peace building talk, uh, and I think you just uh, aptly hit the nail on the head that it really is a, a change in perspective. So I always like to start with showing this little cute video, uh, which really uh, kind of tells us what we're talking about, about the change in perspective. So I'm just going to play it right now and we'll talk on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard Delta Airlines Flight 2998 bound for Atlanta, Georgia with continued service to Dallas. Who can say I just always love that little video because it just tells us in that brief couple of seconds how we tend to, like you say, Laura, read into things, right? As human beings, we read, we reread, we misread into things, and we have all these preconceived notions because we're smart and we piece all these pieces of information together and we think he must be off, you know, ticket first class and traveling around the world. Uh, and then you realize he's just stuck doing his laundry. But I always wanted to start that because, um, uh it really is about perspectives right so i'm going to try and unpack uh my career in the next 60 minutes but of course link it to peace building and and and, and what we're talk talking about the metaverse and transferable skills because that's what jose um had requested for somewhat so uh long story short uh i am a, a an author an educator a a creator um, at least that's what my sign off says. But what does that actually mean, right? And I remember I got asked um, in 2012 to, to write my story. And I thought, am I a little too young to write my story? Uh, but the publisher said, no, you've got a really interesting story. And I said, okay. So I, I, I sat down to write my, what I call like a leadership memoir that was like in 2011 or 2012. Um, and now I'm on to my fifth book, but it's called Woman on Top, The Art of Smashing Stereotypes and Breaking All the Rules. And I, re, I remind, I was, I'm reminded that I actually wrote one chapter of the book called The Book of Jobs, because what I wanted to do was to delineate and list all the different jobs that I had taken on, right, which include like doing sales, um, even at a, ha even working at haberdashery, but that's not from my own doing or choice, because my family then own a haberdashery, so even though I I had to learn how to knit and I was actually a pretty good knitter by the way. I worked as a server, maybe last year for one day, you know, as an actor. I even taught gym, right? I was a radio DJ, but yada yada yada. So there were so many different things that I've done. Uh and oftentimes when I'm asked, you know, what is it that I do, like in my sign-off, I these days I just say educator, creator, um, author. But really I think that this notion of a career and just one career is so uh, didactic and so dogmatic, right? I think that all the little things that I've done have all informed each other, informed me and made me more nuanced and taken me to where I am today. And I'll get to that in a while because we're getting to the metaverse, right? So let's start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. 
as we say in the sound of music. So this is me. This is my family. I'm born and raised in Singapore. Uh, I haven't seen my family for three years. Well, next year will be my third year not seeing them. So I'm really excited to see them next year. Jose just asked me when I'll take the vacation. So next year, I booked my flight. So we'll go see mom and dad. So my whole family is like me. We're all multi-hyphenates. We are actors, producers, directors, filmmakers, singers, um, businessmen, uh, uh, musicians. I mean, we, we just do a lot. And I think uh, there's something to be said about the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I think there is that. Uh, but I also know that I, I am in an incredibly privileged position because I have a family that is supportive, right? A lot of the work that I do today, which I'll talk about later, is because I'm aware that what I have is a privilege and I try to extend the privilege that I have to the communities that aren't able to have the support that I had growing up, right? So that has defined a lot of who I am and what I do. So I thought that I was going to, um, as most of you around the room, I think most of you look fairly young, I can't tell, but I imagine that that career sounds like it's that very important thing, right? Mom and dad may ask, what are you studying? What is it going to do to advance your career? I thought too, I was going to be a professor because I read my PhD in UCLA. I thought that was it. I was going to be a professor leading a fairly comfortable life in UCLA. But when I was 23 or four, I've said this story a couple times before, but um, I witnessed two suicides and that really just radically changed my life at a really young age. Um, I'm, I know for a fact there have been other people that have gone through far worse circumstances than me. But for me, at 23 or 24, that just shook my world, witnessing two suicides. I didn't really have the vocabulary to deal. Um, and long story short, I, I, I was in a very dark place until I met a doctor uh, who reminded me that danger and opportunity are one and the same. And in fact, he spoke to me in Mandarin and he said, I hope nobody speaks Mandarin here because then you'll know that I said it badly. But in Mandarin, it is true that danger and opportunity are one and the same words. That's the flip side. Danger presents opportunities. And I always bore that in mind. And given what I'd gone through, I, I didn't feel that it was right for me to continue my comfortable life in UCLA and you know after my PhD going on to become like assistant professor. I, I felt like I needed to find answers. So like Siddhartha, who had to leave the palace to find answers when he saw sickness, old age, ill health, death, he wanted to find answers. I too went on this journey to find, to seek answers. I wasn't very rich, obviously, as a, as a young 20 something uh, graduate student. I took myself then to Cambodia, where I worked with sex traffic workers. And I think that was my biggest enlightenment that would take me on all my journeys later. So allow me to just expound on that for just a little bit. For those of you who've heard the story, I'm sorry, but it is a, a hallmark and cornerstone of, of what has made me. So I remember working with um, all these sex traffic workers. They're, they're, they're um, aged between eight to 18, and some of them are younger and they're not in, in, in the photo here. And I remember asking them, and this is where you can unmute as well and, and put yourself in their shoes. So if you are between the ages of eight to 18 and you're a sex traffic worker, and if I asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you think would be some of the answers I would get? What do you want to be when you grow up? Eight to 18, sex traffic worker. What do you want to be when you grow up? Anyone? Hmm. Anyone just unmute and go ahead. Anybody? Oh, some something in the chat. Uh, anyone? Laura, Jose. Yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, I so it's actually changed a lot. I mean, from uh, my own upbringing, I thought going into business was what you needed the to three. do. Yeah, yeah. You, you're like, oh, get a business degree to work in a business job. They make money. But there was right. really no like, cons this is me back in, you know, my late teen. No, yeah, high school, basically, that, that was my which is like two years ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so that would be the answer that I get from a lot of, you know, students or, or participants from the developed world, right, to be a doctor, to be, uh, to be a to be a businessman, to be a scientist, to be a princess, to be and um, but I ask these girls, what do you be when you grow up? And most of them had these answers, they want to be a doctor, a teacher, a nurse, 
which of course begets the next question and I'll say why and they say well because they want to save the world and every time I tell this story I have that little gulp in my throat because I'm reminded that these are girls who have been sex trafficked and have had the most hideous things done to them and yet they have the audacity of hope to want to think of saving the world and I remember like my really young self there my 23 four year old self I remember thinking that wow I was really going to try to change my perspectives and my attitudes about life. Like what happened to me was horrible and tragic that to witness two suicides, but fundamentally no one should be able to make me feel inferior without my consent. Because I looked at these girls and I just saw how strong they were in the face of adversity. And I made a little pact with myself then, my 24 year old self that I still, that I still am. <laughs> and I made that little pact myself and I told myself that, my ability to choose is built on the backs of the millions of boys and girls and men and women who may never have the ability to choose. And I began to see my right to choose as a privilege. The fact that I could choose to even go to Cambodia to surf was a privilege. So I made a little pact with myself and told myself that if I was going to make a choice, I would always be responsible for my actions. And this is not to say that I don't make mistakes, but I'll always take accountability for my chosen mistakes, right? Because that is already a privilege because none of these girls asked to be sold into sexual slavery, right? I'm also gonna check the chat to see what's there. Yeah, yeah, feel free to put um, questions, thoughts, etc. I'll check that. And then I began to develop on my own philosophy and I realized that just the ability to do what we love puts us at the top of the pyramid. Because some of these girls that I work with are really at the bottom of the pyramid. And I don't mean bottom in terms of a, a lack, but I just mean they have certain needs that are lacking, right? They, they, don't, they don't feel safe, right? Um, and they sometimes don't even have proper shelter or, or, or food, right? So that just puts them squarely at the, at the bottom of the pyramid. And yet they have a sense of self-esteem. So I realized that and I reconfigured Maslow's hierarchy of needs in my own little head at 24 years old. And I realized that my ability to just choose puts me at the top of the pyramid already. So if I was ever going to choose, I was going to make great choices, be responsible for them. Because many people around the world, and I'm actually also working with some of my Afghan students right now, what they want is just their physiological needs, just to feel safe, just to even have food and water and feel safe, right? Like these are things that around us, a lot of communities, are still lacking. But of course, I know today, and it's a bit of a joke, but then I also think it's real, that I think that Maslow's hierarchy of needs have been reconfigured, that I think today what we really need more than food, water, shelter, and warmth is Wi-Fi and battery, right? So, uh, but that said, that was my why and my purpose that I'll, I'll come back to in a while. So once I found my life purpose, um, I realized that I wasn't content to just go back into academia and be a professor. I was really interested in real life and telling real people's stories. And I realized that what I'd gone through enabled me to have more empathy. And I began to embark on a career of directing. And I fell into directing quite by accident um, because uh, uh, the artistic director had called me and said, our director had, um, and a, a miscarriage will you step in as a, as a director and all I can remember then was like oh my god I don't know how to direct right but my altruistic self the, the the sense of me that said I can't let this woman that just had a miscarriage feel terrible right like I had to just step up so that she has she can be absolved of responsibility because you know I was just really thinking of her but little did I know that jumping into this role really changed my life because I realized that I had no idea what being a director was, but I got it. I loved it. And it just introduced me to this whole world um, that if I had not embarked and taken that chance and just said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> and literally that voice, I wouldn't be where I am today. And this led me to a, a fascinating career directing, working on uh, lots of productions, uh, Vagina monologues, and that's where the Broadway part of our title comes in from Broadway to Boardroom and then the Metaverse, um, exploring really interesting um, uh, topical issues, right? From directing black box topical issues to directing big uh, Broadway type uh, musicals that we stage in Asia and the Esplanade, which is a big theater in Singapore, um, having like a jazz legend, Laura Fiji. She's kind of like the, the um, living version of. Um, Billy Holiday, the Dutch living version of like a Billy Holiday, 
um, directing these large scale musicals that you can just tell from how the staging is. Um, I'll just show you a quick little clip because um, seeing is believing, right? So I think you could just, so it, it, so basically this part of the conversation is about the Broadway part, um, sharing with you just some of the interesting projects that I've undertaken and what I've learned as a result. I journeyed from just directing like one kind of production to really just going to different genres, including big large scale magic shows, even having the chance to create music with top musicians. I'll just let you listen to a little um, track that I got a chance to produce. It's a, in an album that I produced. I'll just, I'll just forward it a little bit. Love is magic. if you've asked me before I did a project would I ever be producing an album and working on an album no right but I think it was just leaning in and one project leads to another and every time I'll say yes to a project and then I'll back paddle and then I'll say okay now I'll I mean back and, and then I'll say yes first and then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll go back and like do it right I mean most times some of these projects I've never done every time I ask to do a new project right so like even when um, Jose has asked me to do this I say, I say yes and then I go back and, and and prep the deck right it's not like I have a deck prepared for this so most times I, I always say yes first, I jump in, I lean in, and in the process I learn so much. I mean, I wouldn't have produced an album or worked on, on, on music if I didn't say yes to producing a show that required original music and all that. I also um, got a chance then to even host my own um, radio show because I started being really um, um, uh, uh, prominent in, in the arts scene. But then, of course, with every career, there's always going to be a lulls and, and downturns. In my case, um, at the height of my career, I obviously uh, encountered the 2008-2009 financial crisis, right? Kind of like what we're going through now with the pandemic. Uh, and with that, it that wasn't if that wasn't bad enough, because lots of um, sponsors didn't want to sponsor theatrical productions anymore, right? Because obviously they were having a, a financial crunch themselves. So that was hard enough for a theater company. Uh, to make matters worse, my mother was actually diagnosed with a tennis, uh, with, a, with a tumor the size of a tennis ball. So I remember that I had to make a choice. At the height of my career, financial crisis, mom was having a, a brain tumor. But I remember being able to go back to my why and my sense of centeredness and saying, what is it that really mattered to me? And I realized it was my family, right? So I really dedicated my time. I took off from work to dedicate all my time to caring for mom. And I remember making a little um, bargain with myself. And I said, okay, you know, deities, gods, goddesses, you get very greedy when you're desperate, right? So I prayed to every single god, goddess out there and, you know, and just said, well, if, if, my mom gets better. I, I, I will, you know, do so and so. And 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 my mom um, is still here today, right? So I and I kept my promise. Yeah, and I really dedicated my my time to my family and and and, and serving the community. One of the other things that I also embarked upon was really dedicating more and more time to my family's business, right? 
because um, while I was running my theater company, we also had a family business that I, that I was involved in as a creative director, but I was so involved in, in the theater side that I had neglected um, my family business. So part of my bargain and negotiation um, for my mom's health was that I'm going to devote more time to my family. And I did. I went back to my family business, helmed our family business. Um, we, we had a design agency. And so I really started working um, a lot more for our own agency, working with some of these clients that you would find familiar, right? Uh, working with Samsung, Nike, Louis Vuitton, right? Um, BNP Paribas, got a chance to work with Serena Williams when she came to Singapore. Devoted my time to working on my family business, but also devoting a lot more time to the community because what, that's one of the bargains that I made that I'm going to spend so much more time in the community. Um, started really telling stories of the community, right? My fifth book will be out next year and we're looking at um, uh, alternative modalities of, of motherhood. So my next book would be on mothers that are not the, the heteronormative norm. All right, so refugee moms, LGBTQIA moms, migrant moms, um, incarcerated moms, etc. I also devote a lot of my time to giving back to the community, doing a lot of speaking engagements. Um, but I also always taught because remember cross reference, my first job thought that I thought I was going to have forever was a professor. So I always made sure that I always gave back to the community as my way of learning constantly from students as well. So I always taught. So one of the things that I found great joy in, I think Jose's always asked me that, like, where do you find time? And for me, it was I found what I was good at quite early and I found what I love to do. For me, that was a winning formula. And so I always made sure I gave time to either be visiting uh, in person in Japan, this was pre-corona, or be giving um, talk stories like this with the Matsunaga Institute of Peace. Another key piece, and I'm going to be linking all these together in our careers in peace building, was that I also said yes to a consulting job in, in Bhutan, where I was asked to consult for the government of Bhutan when they became democratic. Um, that in itself is a whole talk on its own. But suffice to say that part of the learnings in Bhutan really taught me about notions of gratitude, notions of compassion, and notions of just really being able to be appreciative of what you have, that sense of contentment, which is very different from what we think about in Western philosophy of happiness. In Bhutan, happiness is defined more as a sense of appreciation, gratitude, and contentment. I documented this in, in a film I could put in the chat later where you can access that film. But here is a little short trailer and then I'll take which will then take us to the next part of my career. So here goes. It seems peace, love and happiness could be a choice after all. 20 years ago, my partner committed suicide from depression. And I set out to find out the meaning of life and the secret to happiness. I felt I had a story to tell, and I wanted to share it because this is not just a story about me, but about the people I meet. I wanted to share a story on overcoming, on how you can get stronger, even though life can be difficult. Aha, uh -huh. so yeah, you can catch the film. Um, it's, it's for free, it's for free distribution. I can put the link in the chat later on. So I think with, with my experience at Bhutan, I, I, was, I felt like I was really ready for a change. And here I am, I moved to Hawaii, right? So at the age of 40, I decided that I was ready for a change uh, and I moved to Hawaii. So here I am at the top office, this is Makapu. Yeah, it's Makapu, right? Um, in fact, um, one of my first jobs, the minute I uh, moved here, I got hired by Tesla. Um, and of course, for most people, that will be like a dream job. I got to work with Elon Musk, right? And receive emails from him and get to work with Elon Musk. But deep down, I knew that I really wanted to honor who I was. And I really felt like I had to go back to wh who I really am. I am an educator. I'm a creator. And, and I'm an artist. So uh, when Leeward offered me... Uh, a position, I, I said goodbye to Tesla and I came back to my roots in advocacy and education and creation, which has led me here uh, also to Matsunaga Institute of Peace. Um, and then, of course, now this just all is like roller coaster, right? And of course, no story is ever complete without yet more drama. And at 
I think 40, I was also diagnosed with miserable malalignment syndrome, which means that my bones are completely misaligned, meaning that I'll, I'm, I, I have uh, an end-stage arthritis. But, you know, ever the optimist, right? I mean, I still found time to get married. That's me um, getting married in a wheelchair. So, you know, I never walked down the aisle. I rolled down the aisle, guys and gals. Um, and, you know, I, I still found time to uh, go grocery shopping in Costco and make sure that, you know, I, I made myself useful and volunteered myself to be a shopping cart since I can't help my spouse and my partner carry any groceries. Um, and more importantly, I found that time because I couldn't really walk for two years, I had to learn and unlearn and relearn walking because I had nine surgeries. I really devoted a lot of my time to writing because, you know, I was strapped to my chair, right? <laughs> so I, I churned out uh, two, two books when I couldn't walk. Uh, but I, I always made sure that I devoted uh, my stories to the community, working with women in the community. One book here was um, on the women here in Waianae and the proceeds will go to the Women of Waianae Scholarship Fund. So now I'm coming to uh, the pieces that Jose was asking, like, what are some transferable skills? What are some life lessons? And for me, if I put my life story and my career together, they are intertwined and I don't think I could separate them from each other. I think there's this misconception that your career has to be in this clear linear path. And that once you graduate, you'll know exactly what you're gonna do and you just hit to that. I think today we're beginning to hear a lot more narratives and different narratives as well. Um, Jose, for example, didn't end up becoming the businessman um, that he thought he was going to be, but he's here now at Matsunaga Institute of Peace. Not to say you're not doing good business, but saying it's slightly different. Um, you know, for my life lessons, like witnessing the two suicides, um, going through my dad's cancer, um, going through the financial crisis, seeing my mom's brush with death with a brain tumor, um, understanding now that I have to contend that my skeletal system is not doing the job it's supposed to do. All these things taught me lessons that I in turn took into my career, right? So, so what is that? And, and how do I begin to, or how do you begin to unpack what is your career path? And I think I've given you a lot of clues already, even before Simon Sinek came up with the book, um, Start With Why, I conceptualized that in my head and thought I needed to find my North Star and my purpose, right? Finding your why and finding a sense of purpose is really important. And here is Simon Sinek um, talking about finding your why. What is the impact of finding your why? So I can tell you what I went through, which is what set me on the journey um, to sharing the message of the why and, and uh, helping people find theirs. Um, a why is like a, is like a, it's like a compass direction. It, it tells you where you're going. Um, we can live our lives by accident, which is kind of like getting in a ship and just sailing or getting in a car and just driving. You'll absolutely see some amazing things. You'll stumble an, upon some amazing experiences, but you don't really have a sense of where you're going, any sort of direction. In other words, what's it all for? What the why does is it provides a path, it provides a map or a compass. So you will still have some of those amazing experiences, but now they have value and worth and they're taking you towards something else. Um, it's a journey towards something. Um, when I learned my why, um, I had this tremendous calm come over me, uh, a sense of uh, my confidence grew, um, a sense that my life had more meaning than I thought it had before. And I had now the choice, um, a new way of viewing decisions, a filter, um, through which to make decisions, which now I would ask myself, does this help um, advance my why or not? Does this help me stay on the path that I'm supposed to be on? Or is this going to be a random, a random uh, adventure? So the why provides focus, direction, meaning, and, and, and confidence. Let's talk a little bit about purpose. Um, one of the things, the mis uh, I think one of the mistakes that people make is they think purpose comes from their job, right? And we see this in military and non-military, which is I've been a whatever for so many years and when then I lose my job or I retire, I now don't have a sense of purpose because I've I so closely associated my self-worth with the job that I did. And you said that happened even in the military where I knew what my job was, I had a sense of purpose. And one wonders if those things are conflated, right? Mm -hmm. Which is I had a sense of purpose for my job and then when I didn't have the job, when I left the military, all of, all of a sudden I sense I didn't know what, I woke up in the morning, didn't know what to do. Um, um, you had a sense of service uh, because of the community 
and now you've found a sense of service because you're in, literally in service to, to that community again. And I'm just going to pause there because that was actually the pact that I made to myself, right, uh, when my mom was ill, that I really wanted to devote my time to the community. And I think that is why I, I have over the last two decades really been devoting my time to community because that was what I, I literally said when my mom was ill, that I'm going to devote my time to the community. Um, and here she is still today, right? But secret pact made with the heavens aside, there is a lot of truth in finding that sense of purpose that guides you as your North Star in your career. And over the years, I founded a few businesses and I've kind of like rebranded from thinking that I was going to be a professor to being a director. I recognized at the heart of all that I was doing was that I really want to be a catalyst for good, a catalyst for change. So the next um, you know, decade of my career was founding companies that allowed me the opportunity to provide opportunities for other people. So because I was able to be a creative and a creative director, I wanted to use that sense of purpose and creativity to work with BIPOC, LGBTQIA, first-time entrepreneurs, because there are a lot of um, BIPOC, uh, first-time entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs who are unable to hire agencies because agencies are very expensive. So I deliberately kept uh, my agency smaller so that we can keep our cost low to take on projects like this is a project we took on for a first time entrepreneur that is starting a fintech brand a fintech app um, this is working with a country of bhutan they, again they don't really have a lot of budget but they wanted to rebrand their products and so we thought of interesting new low-cost ways to help them rebrand um, over the pandemic i also created future skills because i started thinking about how I would be unable to travel to give my service learning and leadership because I used to travel to teach in the rural parts of, say, Philippines or Bhutan or Cambodia. And if I'm unable to do that, I thought probably lots of people are unable to do that as well. So I started Future Skills, and I think Jose was part of our first um, panel and a couple of other people as well. And we provided all these resources freely to communities who wanted it. So I was I had the blessing of having lots of uh, 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 movers and shakers, innovators and influencers join me on my panel, including you know the Minister of Bhutan, including the CEO of um, big Fortune 500 companies, right? So we've been able to um, share all our webinars uh, to our community as well. And that's the community actually collectively doing a big thank you to us to say thank you for what we're doing. Uh, and um, I also then extended um, the training, the coaching as well to communities of need. Um, you know, even helping in programs like Think Tech, et cetera. And here in Leeward, uh, we also created like a little caravan theater. It's a little um, uh, theater group. So for students who graduated from the theater classes, but still want to do the theater, they're able to come back to caravan and be able to be part of this community, right? Um, this is us creating projects in the Wainai Moku campus. Um, some people, even in the UH um, umbrella, don't even know that there's actually a Wainai Moku campus. So we started a theater program there as well. And we take our, our theater programs out to the community. This is at the Boys and Girls Club. So at this point, I mean, we are at the 30 minute mark. It sounds like, okay, you're probably saying, but Loretta, you've done so much, right? I can't keep up. But my point is if we narrow it down and look really deeply and truly into the essence of what we're doing, what I really was doing actually just comes down to, I would like to say four things and two values. Um, the four things that I do and love to do is to create, to connect, to communicate and to collaborate. And the two things that you must have, at least to do the work that I do, is to have these values of courage and conviction. Uh, and that's basically what I've done for the last um, three decades of my life, right? To create, connect, communicate, and, and collaborate. Uh, and which now takes us to the next part um, of my conversation, which is of course a huge leap of faith um, into the metaverse. So before I unravel what the metaverse is, maybe this is a good time for me to pause and take some questions and ask, what do you know about the metaverse and what do you think it is? Um, Anybody? Like, what is the metaverse and what do you think it is? Anyone? Anybody? The 
those in the audience, you are able to unmute yourself, if so, please. I personally don't know anything about it. It just sounds something technologically related. That's it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you're definitely on, on, on the right track, right? I mean, it is definitely to do with tech. Um, but the reason why I termed our talk from Broadway to boardroom into the metaverse was that all the skills that I learned from the Broadway part of my career, right, the creativity, the connectivity, the communication, um, the daring, the daring to fail, daring to take chances, led me into the boardroom because I had to lead C-suites when I'm discussing these multi-million dollar projects for Samsung or Nikon or Louis Vuitton. We were seated there with C-suites. I needed to have the same courage and conviction to convince them of this marketing plan that we're about to embark upon. There has to be clarity of vision and there definitely has to be a lot of think through, thought through, projection and envisioning. So all the skill sets that I garnered prepared me for the metaverse. Why? Because the metaverse is being invented as we speak. And it, it is correct to say that we don't really know what it is just yet because it is being built as we speak. So if I had to answer your question and say, what is the metaverse? I will answer it as so. The tech visionaries see the metaverse as an alternative to our real world. Um, and in fact, I would say it's not just an alternative, but it would be an augmentation to our real world. I mean, the fact that we're in this Zoom world, right? We, we Google, right? We use our cell phones. We are already in the metaverse, right? This is just, think about this as just smartphones 2.0 or smart gadgets 2.0 or um, Internet Explorer Safari 2.0. So the metaverse is a virtual world where our digital avatars and those of people and communities around the globe can come together to work, shop, attend classes, pursue hobbies, enjoy social gatherings and more. So in a metaverse world, all of us would be little meta um, avatars, but we would be in this immersive world. So we could say we want to hold the Matsunaga Institute of Peace talks in Greece right and then we could like offer the olive branch literally and we could all be like digital avatars and we could be interacting in the same space the metaverse will not only mirror the real world in its 3d complexity but it will actually allow us to be and do what was previously unimaginable so for example right now we're all still sort of um uh, uh, say for our, you know, virtual backgrounds, right? That's the only thing we can pretty much change right now in our Zoom rooms. Uh, you can actually put on your avatars, like you can take on roles, you can take on costumes, and you can actually be fully immersive. So you could literally be walking the moon in your pajamas, you could watch a baseball game from the pitches, or you could be frolicking in a field of unicorns. Basically, anything will be possible in the metaverse. And this is hugely exciting for someone like me that loves to create and I love to have the vision, right, to plan and hit. Like I told you, these were things and skills that I honed when I was um, a creator, both for Broadway as well as in the boardroom. Uh, and to give you more um, idea of what the metaverse could be, Mark Witten, or Mark Witten, the SVP and GM of Unity Create, he was also the former VP of Entertainment Amazon, says that the metaverse is going to be the biggest revolution in computing platforms the world has ever seen. It'd be bigger than the mobile revolution and bigger than the web re uh, revolution. Unity itself is building tools and services to enable people to create metaverse content. And of course, uh, Unity is not the only one in there. Lots of other big tech companies are in there too. Some of them you've probably heard of. NVIDIA, Roblox, Epic Games, Microsoft, and of course, the one that everyone's looking out for, the Zuck, right? The Zuck has already um, come out to say that he really wants to play a big part in the metaverse. And he's come out to say, in addition to being the next generation of the internet, the metaverse is also going to be the next chapter for us in the company. And coming years, Mark Zuckerberg says that people will transition from seeing Facebook primarily as a social media company to being a metaverse company. It does have a few people getting quite jittery, right? But I think collectively, because the, meta, uh, the metaverse is still being created, we are able to potentially deflect um, Facebook's domination. And how is this relevant for us in education? 
right? So for example, like I said earlier, instead of us having this meeting in a Zoom world, which is still fairly two-dimensional, we could actually be taking trips, right? Literally into um, Rome. So Richard Karras, who's NVIDIA's general manager for the Omniverse, says that students, like all of us, we could meet anywhere in the world. We could even meet for a class trip in ancient Rome. Students are able to peer right inside every nook and cranny of the Colosseum with a virtual gladiator powered by artificial intelligence to handle questions. And right now, Karras is overseeing a metaverse infrastructure project called the Omniverse that allows developers around the world to collaborate in real time and build metaverse content. Uh, and if that is just sort of like, okay, that is too heady for me. Let's just talk about what the what commerce or shopping will be like in the metaverse. John Egan, who is the CEO of Le Atelier at BNP Paribas, which is a French bank, uh, postulates that commerce will take place in the metaverse because users will be able to buy and sell virtual pets from dogs and cats to dragons, right? And you could even purchase like services like pet walking, dog walking, pet grooming, cat grooming services. I'll probably have to end up purchasing for 15 cats, right? Um, there are also lots of other business opportunities in the metaverse, including virtual weddings and parties. I mean, already you're seeing this happen in the post pandemic world. You're already seeing this happen already, right? Um, you're going to see a lot more private, private tours, right? Allowing you to um, I think Airbnb has also ventured into taking people into these like experiences through Airbnb. The potential is really unending. And the other thing to note is that in the metaverse, entrepreneurs probably won't be taking cash, right? The way we know it. Um, tech visionaries say that transactions may probably involve credit cards. Uh, that will still take a while for credit cards to accept cryptocurrency, but we will be seeing online payment like PayPal, and cryptocurrency take uh, even bigger prominence, right? So for example, you could purchase virtual pets and have your pets be uh, verified because they would have like virtual DNA. Again, I'm not gonna get too techy into it. So I'm just gonna uh, um, talk about other big movements in the metaverse, including business in the metaverse, right? Uh, that there's a postulation that every Fortune 1000 company will have a metaverse strategy. Already we're seeing this happen, that real world businesses are participating in the metaverse um, in addition to their brick and mortar facilities. So you as a consumer, as a customer, you will be able to visit virtual reality outlets and try on things in 3D at full scale. So if you're a very tall person, you could actually check if you could stand comfortably inside a tent before purchasing it. These are actually projects we're actually already working on with our clients um, in retail. Um, for real estate agents, instead of showing clients the, the house or the apartment or condo, you could actually use the metaverse to allow for virtual tours. In fact, that was how I purchased my house over the pandemic. I did like a virtual 360 tour online before I even got to see the house um, in real life, right? So the metaverse will be a quantum leap for remote work and will allow for more effective collaborations because we'll be able to collaborate that much faster safer and even possibly cheaper which now takes me to what we are doing in cobble land and in smoker studios if all that has just like wow this is just too much for me uh you know i kind of like my simple life in hawaii uh, i understand but this is what we're doing in smoker studios that we are creating a metaverse that is not just heady it's not just slasher and hacker games uh, but we really want to bring in our sense of innocence and our sense of joy. Uh, my founder and I are both very joyful, happy, go lucky people. I mean, just look at the land we're trying to create, right? So uh, let me first explain what Smobler Studios is. Smobler Studios, my latest um, venture, is actually a combination of two Swedish words um, from the word small and from the word furniture. Because how Smobler started was that it really began as a YouTube channel by my business partner and his wife. What they wanted to do was to just, they were hobbyists and they created scale models of IKEA furniture. I know in Hawaii, most of us like IKEA furniture, right? We can't get it. So it's like, we want it even more. So they created these scale, little cute furniture pieces just to put online. Uh, but this kind of blew up and led to my co-founder developing small assets, digital assets 
for Sandbox, which is a, a player in a, the blockchain technology. Anyway, I'll get to that in a little while. Um, long story short, I joined Smobler as a co-founder and as a partner. And um, this will lead, lead us to the next chapter of our conversation. Um, but let me just take a pause there to go back to why we started this conversation in the first place, careers and peace building and linking all these pieces together. That how we got here was not a function of technology or business. It was really a function of Ruel loving to be a comics designer. He loved to draw comics. That's his art, literally. He loved to draw comics, but there was no market. There was no industry. But that never stopped him from continuing with his passion. And he just kept doing little comics, even though he couldn't find a market for it. Later on, as the technology evolved, he was able to create his little comics using the computer. So he started doing this web comic that, you know, kind of like nobody, nobody was really watching, but he, he felt compelled to do this. So he created these comics with what we call two point perspective, right? And it's just, you know, it's very simple comic strip. And what's the story about? Well, it's a very simple fictional depiction of the life of the author, my co-founder Ruel and his friends, living in a small apartment as they prepare for their architecture board exams. If it sounds like it's real life, it is, right? That was him as an architecture student. Um, he couldn't really find a lot of work as, as an architect in the Philippines as well. So he really poured his energy uh, into creating these comics, right? Again, not thinking there would ever be a platform for it. But he just kept creating. And later on, as technology kept up, he kept on with his comics and he put his little comics on Instagram and then he put them on TikTok. Uh, again, not for commercial value, but just because he simply loved it. Like that was who he was. He loved comics and he loved animation. And then he thought, well, because I love my cobble creation so much, it's not making me any money, but that didn't matter. But I wanted to personalize my comics and make them into little mugs, right? He thought, what is the one thing that everyone has on their table? They'll all have a mug. So he thought, if I could personalize mugs for people, I could be able to sell these mugs, right? People will want to customize these cute cobble mugs. And you could have like a Jose cobble, Laura would have a Laura cobble, Rosalind would have a Rosalind cobble, Jessica would have a Jessica cobble, and Loretta will have a Loretta cobble, right? And that was his grand plan. But it was going to get bigger, right? So then he thought, okay now let me come up with a series let me come up with personalized characters but i want series right so i'm going to create like um uh the the zodiac series which was supposed to be for 2021 but then what happened as we all know what happened in 2020 the pandemic happens so all of that was shut down because these plans to roll out his personalized labs to create all these cobble characters on a mug was completely decimated because of the pandemic, right? But again, Ruel kept on with his creation. He was like, okay, I still love to create, right? I was gonna just keep creating my, my animated characters. But in the meantime, what was happening as Ruel would kept creating his comics, creating them on mugs, a simultaneous technology um, boom was happening. People were coming in more and more with this thing called NFTs or non-fungible tokens. It allowed creators a way to put a stamp on their creations the way, in a way they couldn't have previously before NFTs, right? There was no way to prove ownership before NFTs or before the blockchain technology. So even though Ruel didn't quite see all this happening, right he was just creating his comics because he was compelled to the technology was actually enabling him to fuse these worlds together so he decided okay now i'm going to try to create my zodiac series as limited edition prints and i'm going to offer them as non-fungible tokens so all of this was really simultaneous okay so all these things were coming together but again, no real clear plan. Uh, he was just a hobbyist. Uh, but I just wanted to show you a little cute um, animation of what he's done just to break up the talk story for a while. Right. Where do you live? 
In the city. Do you have a house? Apartment. Want to rent? Rent. What do you do for a living? Lots of things. Where's your office? I don't have one. How come? I don't need one. Where's your wife? Don't have one. How come? It's a long story. Do you have kids? No, I don't. How come? It's an even longer story. Are you my dad's brother? What's your record for consecutive questions asked? 38. I'm your dad's brother, all right. You have much more hair than your nose than my dad. How nice of you to notice. I'm a kid. That's my job. And basically, Ruel created all these animations really um, to entertain his um, child with special needs, right? And, but the point is he kept with what he was doing, but literally he know that technology was fast keeping up with his creativity. And so, where do you live? <laughs> which leads us to where we are today. That if you had asked me 20 years ago, or even two years ago, if we were able to create the world that we want to create now, I would say no because our dreams were too big, too fantastic, too futuristic for the technology. We wanted to create a world. I was a storyteller, I was a director, I loved telling stories, and uh, Ruel loved creating. He loved creating comics, he loved creating these cobbled characters. But today, finally, we actually purchased land and we got land, digital land, where our characters can inhabit. Basically, Ruel had submitted for a competition, the Game Makers Fund, and he proposed an idea to create the cobble land full of these cobble characters. It's like stepping to the world of Smurfs, right? But these are all cobble characters in cobble land. Uh, and his idea actually won. And so we won the Game Makers Fund, and we're giving land, right? Like digital land to produce our cobble land. So think of it as like in the real world, we're given land to build and create this little cobble land universe and we're able to do this now in the digital world so this is our, de uh, our design concept I, I won't go too uh, much into it because we're still in the midst of um creating but our idea was to create like a sense of the world's fair meets cobble land with all our cute cobble characters meets a theme park so recognize that the metaverse doesn't always have to be dystopian right it doesn't always have to be scary slash and burn slash and hack it can also be filled with cute cuddly characters like cobble characters and so that is our concept for our land it's going to be the world's fair meets theme park uh and of course because i'm from singapore and Ru that's uh, and ruel worked in singapore as well a lot of our concepts were actually inspired by singapore because singapore is really futuristic so uh, I can't share all the designs right now because it's still under creation, but we created this world that if you enter it as a cobble character, this will be what you could see in our cobble land world, right? So it's not just a land for little children, but it's also a land for big people because it is designed to be um, an expo hall. It's designed to have theme parks, it's designed to have an aquarium, a water park. So mom and daddy can take kids in there. Um, romantic couples can take each other into uh, the metaverse as well and spend a day at, at Cobble Land walking in the butterfly sanctuary, right? So this is the world um, that we are currently creating uh, for Cobble Land. Just to give you a little sneak preview of how this may look like, I am just going to uh, show you right here. <laughs> So you can fancy, you know, a day out at the Pomoc that's designed by our, our studios, right? Like we kind of reconfigured the day bit. So if you don't want to hang out by um, the Hawaii beaches, you can like, oh, I want to go into the Pomoc right today. So you can escape into your metaverse and into the Pomoc. Um, we also uh, created, um, we also like, because Ruel was trained as an architect. So he's also created another um, uh, game uh, inspired by modern min minimalist architecture, right? So this is, and he wants to build a community living in this sort of metaverse um, uh, community, and it's called the Hex. So, and this is really inspired by Ruel's um, work before when he worked in a company building modular and temporary structures, right? So I just want to show you how the Hex could look like. So if you imagine, you can take your little avatar and go into the Hex.
And um, and again, this is also where for those of you who say, oh no, this is all too techy for me. Uh, remember the metaverse is what we make it up to be. Um, Ruel's grandmother uh, has Alzheimer's. And remember I told you that my own mother baffled brain tumor and dementia. So this is actually something we created um, it's an RPG game, but it's about the protagonist dealing with dementia at the height of his career. So the point is the metaverse can be what you make it out to be. It doesn't have to be just slash and burn, right? It can be meaningful uh, production. So this is something that we created because we're inspired by what's happened to, to our family members. So this is called Poetry in My Memory, which is a poem driven fantasy. And here's our protagonist going on his adventure. He's lost his memory. have to be slash and burn right so I'm, I'm just going to move a little bit more uh, but in case you're wondering how we put these worlds together here is um, a quick video uh, a one minute video to show you how we put these worlds together using the tools that we have okay <laughs> it's actually a lot of work right it's very time consuming uh but i think we're just really thrilled that our creativity has has an outlet right and has a platform and all our ideas um has has a place to go and the project that we're working on now uh is called uh, tools of rock um and basically i'll just show you a quick snippet it's going to be a virtual concert if you're wondering uh like what virtual concert can these really take off well actually tickets have all been sold out um, and uh, even Snoop Dogg, uh, he's ventured into the metaverse as well, just so you know, right, 
Snoop Dogg's also giving virtual concerts in, 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 in the metaverse. But this is one of our clients, Tools of Rock. So we're designing the, the concert arena for, for our client. And this is just a quick preview of what, this is a very early rendition. So it's gonna get, it's gonna look even better. Okay, so uh, here's <laughs> launching next year. So I think in some we're trying to get to my closing already that I, I think the metaverse is still um, much debated about some are still like, I don't like it, right. But I mean, I, I just all I ask is what Laura was saying at the start to be open, because in a not too long ago future, uh, not too long ago, not too distant past, we were probably saying, Oh, my God, Y2K, right? It's 2000. The world's gonna end, right? Like, I remember it as year 2000. We're like, Oh, my God, the world's gonna end. Uh, and people say, oh my God, with the internet, the world's going to end, right? Nobody's going to talk to each other anymore. Um, and I think that the progress of time is it's, it's going to happen. Uh, the metaverse is is here, right? Rex Woodbury, um, uh, uh, a commentator, a social commentator that, that I, I, I like to read about, he argues that uh, the reason why metaverse will have a huge take-up rate is because young people, children, are on games. And because they're already exposed to games and gaming, they will, they are already in the world of the metaverse because gaming is social and social is gaming, right? Uh, and so we predict and we believe that gaming will fuel a boom in blockchain and NFT crypto and decentralization because you don't really need to understand what all these concepts mean, right? But for these gamers, what they really want to know is that, oh, I can transfer all of this stuff that I have from this space to another space that I can own it, I can authenticate it. Right. So, I mean, I truly believe that there is now a lot of opp opportunity for us as creators. Like I said, there was a time when little Ruel could only draw little comics with no platform to publish. Right. Uh, but today we are able to create because our dreams are now finally matched by the technology. So my point is don't 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 stop dreaming because the technology has now finally kept up with our dreams. So that's why for us at Mobile Studios, we have gone into partnership with the Sandbox, which is a blockchain based user generated crypto gaming company, right? It, and Sandbox will allow creators to create all these games and own um, the digital and, on, and have ownership on what they create in a way that was not possible before. Today, the market is worth about 60 billion and is projected to be worth about 200 billion in a couple of years. Uh, so for us, um, our little in closing, I mean, we believe that at Smobler, we just want to remain open. We are just happy that we now finally have a way to take all of these dreams and stories uh, into the metaverse. Right. We hope that when Cobble Land opens, you'll be able to join us in our social hub because it's a social hub meets Expo Hall. We hope to see you in Cobble Land. Right. It will enable people and brands to enter into conversation and connection. And we truly believe that this is going to be the future of retail social hubbing community. All right. And so we're just really excited to be early adopters and pioneers in the space. And finally, this is just something that um, uh, Ruel, my co-founder, tweeted. Um, he told his mother, his 70 year old mom a few weeks ago that he bought a few crypto beast eggs and sandbox lands. She told me she's happy to live long enough to see this interesting world we are currently living in. Anyway, thank you all so much. Um, I'm just going to skip through all this for now and say that 
in, in, in short, what I wanted to say is, and tying this back to careers, when I started my career, I thought I was just going to be a professor, right? I told you. But my life took me on such a colorful journey that along the way, I acquired all these skills, right? It was not just the foundational literacies that I acquired. Um, I acquired a set of competencies on critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, communication, collaboration, right? I also developed grit. I'm curious. I take initiative, right? Um, I'm adaptable. I create leadership skills. And all these things, ironically, um, have become the hallmark and cornerstone of 21st century skills. I did not set out to acquire these skills. I got them because I leaned in and I said yes to all my projects and acquired these skills. And just recently, um, McKinsey created a chart for what they call a 56 deltas. They don't want to call it skills, but they call it distinct elements of talent, right? And McKinsey says that in the 21st century, post-corona world, these are the 56 deltas we would all need to have to cope. You need cognitive skills, you need interpersonal skills, you need self-leadership, and you need digital skills. I thought that this was my weakest quadrant, but guess what? I mean, it still is, but I'm really learning. And now that I have really entered the metaverse, this is something that I'm really learning. But my point is, my career has been um, guided not just because I was fixated in just one vision of the world, right? So finally, I just wanted to end also because I think this is befitting for Matsunaga Institute piece that often likes to spread uh, um, messages of equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. I just wanted to end with this video uh, that tells you that when you change perceptions, you can change your world. Uh, so, oh, this one I need to, hang on, so this one I need to uh, exit and show you this video on uh, the website, hold on, okay, all right, let me stop share here. And let me share screen. One second, I really want to end with this, but I couldn't download the, the video because it's on. Um, it's on Instagram. So I'm going to play this video again. Ice cream. Chocolate. Yeah. Let's go, honey. Together, we can find a job by signing up for free wireless. I don't know if you got that, but let me just play that um, again, just once more. Again, it's about changing your perceptions. Just going to play that once more. What do you want to get? Ice cream. Chocolate. Yeah. Let's go, honey. Together, we can find a job by signing up for free wireless. So, you know, I wanted to end with that video because I really thought that it really changes perspectives um, that, you know, sometimes things are always not what it seems, right? Your career, may you may think that your career is going to start out one way and then it takes you on all these adventures and journeys. And, you know, I would be the last person that I don't even have a Google Calendar and Jose is trying to get me to teach me how to set up a Google Calendar. But I'm now actually one of the early players in the metaverse. So, you know, um, never stop dreaming, but, you know, definitely find your why, find that purpose and, and just keep, just keep, just keep chugging along. All right. So time check. I think we have about 12 minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to take them. Oh, thank you guys. Thanks for all the comments. Thanks, Jessica. I appreciate that. Um, any questions at all? Thank you, Alexis. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you. Um, any, any questions for me? Thoughts? 
Um, yeah. I oh, God. can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Um, I don't have a question, but I thought like when I watched all of them, it it gave me like it remind it reminds me of like some of these video games that are very similar to what you like, Sean, and it then like it really like it always reconnects back to like my thoughts of it. And I thought it's like when you said like it took a really long time, I definitely agree. It's like I hear people when like they play video games, they say it takes them like hundreds of hours to create this like amazing world and it's really incredible i think it's like it's really worth it in the end i thought some people they make their own world like some people made their entire like this underwater ocean when it used to be land on minecraft and then there's some other ones where it's like like it's like you can't explain they made this entire kingdom in a cave or something and it's just amazing on how advanced and the creativity and they put like a story behind it too it shows like how much like how amazing it is and also like how advanced the technology is as well on whatever you can create it's like like whatever you think of is like whatever you can create on there so yeah absolutely right alexis you know i i I'll, I'll i'll be the first to say i've never played minecraft or well or what i've never played any of these right but i just sort of launched myself into the world of the metaverse but to your point alexis you know i i think you know i never lost my inner child never never right i always believe i want to believe in children's dreams and what they do because you know if if we had said don't play those video games those are stupid they'll never lead you to anything right but look at the world that's happening now this is the world that's leaving the frontier of change which is why we want to be in it because this is what children play with today right you can come out and say it's stupid don't do it but the fact is the revolution is happening. These kids, like you're saying, they are spending time and creating this. So why not allow these worlds to merge? Not just say it's a stupid idea, it'll never amount to anything. I'm sure a lot of parents have said that before. But now it's like you're recognizing that it's a whole industry and they could actually be creators, right? They could actually be, you know, having a great living, right? Because now the technology has kept up with their playing. The technology has kept up with their creativity, their dreaming. And I think for me, that is the power of continuing to play and dream because the technology is going to keep up. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, thoughts, observations? I'll, I'll make some comments uh, or do my closing and then we can still go back to questions. Um, honestly, I, I have to thank you so much. Uh, this is more than uh, I think I, I bargained for and hopefully everybody else who joined today bargained for as well. Um, and I, uh, I love that you have truly, not only yourself, but bringing in the stories of some of your other, uh, within your community, you know, You've all followed your passions. That's really what it kind of comes down to. You've, um, and, and many times where we try to, as we're raised, we talk about like practicality, transferable skills, and and really it's more of like finding what what are you passionate about, what are you happy makes you happy, uh, and then everything kind of comes together. And that's where the technology now is doing that ex exactly that um, and meeting youth halfway and not even halfway but like meeting them on their playing field because who's better skilled to do this than them so um it is an amazing journey you're on i have no idea where it's going but i look forward to definitely continuing to see where it goes and um <clears throat> we call it careers because <clears throat> that is the attractive word that catches people within higher education um so thank you so much for uh going outside the box and uh yeah and just sharing everything that you have done and just your own hurdles in life and how you've overcome them and never really letting anything stop you which was has just been really inspiring and hopefully it's it's a lesson that can be carried on for a lot of our other people in our communities here so thank you for your kindness leadership in the field as we continue to explore our own journey into profession. But, uh, and then last but not least, thanks for everybody else for joining today's webinar. Deeply appreciate your interest and support in joining us to learn about exploring the journey into the profession through our careers and peace building talk story series. But thank you so much, Loretta. Thank you so much, always a pleasure. Thank you all. Any other questions or otherwise? Yeah? Okay.
Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, hopefully we'll see you in Cobble Land. Yes, uh, I look forward to seeing what your avatar looks like one day. <laughs> yeah, so we've been so busy developing our land. We haven't created our avatar. So I'm like, well, I want to see my avatar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think uh, if any, another thing that was a good lesson to be learned is just, although it's been a pandemic and we've been stuck at home, you didn't allow that to kind of stop your energy and you feel that energy into very creative projects. And so yeah. uh, I hope that other people here in the audience can kind of look back over the past, well, it's been almost two years now. Uh, what are the new things you've learned over the past two years about yourself? Uh, and what new skill sets have you developed? And, and just not just because the pandemic may end at some point in the near future to stop that, but just kind of continue with those lessons and let it keep evolving. Yeah, you know, I, I know we have five minutes, but that is such a great point, Jose, that I don't think we could have embarked on this journey. I don't think Sandbox or the Metaverse could have exacerbated as quickly as it could have, if not for the pandemic, right? Because we're all stuck at home and kids still had to find ways to play. They still had to find ways to us, you know, you know, to create and learn and play and connect. And so the Metaverse really boomed because of the pandemic. Uh, and you're right. I think I kind of feel like, you know, this, it's not, a, it's not, the, this time has just it's more like we're cocooning we're cocooning and now we're you know it's like we're, we're coming up from the, the, the chrysalis and we're emerging from this and we're, we're blooming it's like I, I would have never thought i'd be in the metaverse world being a creative metaverse world if not for the pandemic right so i look back at my career too and i think that was the genealogy and that's why i wanted to take you all the way to the start was that all these danger adversity which i started in my first slide um really shaped and had a huge part in shaping my career, right? And it wasn't just one track, um, but it was all these little milestones in hindsight. They could have seemed really sad or difficult when it was happening, but those were the things that just allowed me to keep, you know, going higher and finding new altitudes. Yeah. Your attitude uh, and aptitude determines your altitude. That's definitely true. Yeah. That's definitely definitely and it appears as though you might have a second book about your life since it's been 10 years now since the last one <laughs> right yeah so my that could be my sixth book yeah so definitely yeah into the metaverse yeah into that yeah cool well, thank you again uh thank you so thank much everybody hang out a little bit and otherwise i'll close out the room shortly <laughs> okay all right bye everybody bye professor chen Thank you so much, Ross. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Jessica. And of course, You're thank welcome. you. All right. Bye bye. See you all. Bye. I gotta I gotta watch your uh, your secrets to happiness. Um, by the way, the Instagram video, uh, I may be able to download it for you if you send me the link to it. Isn't that a great video? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there's there's a there's an app that you can download it and then you can just throw it up onto like a Google Drive and then download it from there. And, throw it and of course, I won't know all these things. So like, yeah, the yeah, person okay. creating the metaverse has no idea how to do all these things. So yeah, I'll send no, it. No, no, but, but I think one of the great things is that you're, uh, you find people though that know those skill sets and- Remember I said create, connect, collaborate. That was one of exactly. my- Exactly, <laughs> very important. Very humble. I don't know how to do it. Please help me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Alexis knows. Alexis helps me with my- with some of my classroom organization. I'm like, oh my God, I have so much stuff. Alexis, help me. So, yeah. All right, guys. Thank you all. I hope this is worth your, your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you, Lorraine.